Hello and welcome to the first flipped video for ECE 108. In this video, our primary focus is proof by contradiction, but before we can really talk about proof by contradiction, we should really talk a little bit about proving implications. So in mathematics, there's lots of statements that you want to prove that have the form of an implication. Just as an example, I might for some reason want to try to prove this statement. If n is prime, then n plus n is not prime. Okay. How could I try to prove that this is the case as an implication? Well, what does it mean for an implication to be true? That's kind of the first question we have to ask. Well, if an implication is true, then either this line is the case, P is true and Q is true, or one of these, these two lines are the case. To put that in another way, I have to show that this third line here can't happen. Right? That's the only case where the implication is false, so I have to throw away that possibility. So how does one do this? Well, we simply notice something. I can split the truth table into two halves, right? This bottom half where P is always false, and this upper half where P is always true. Now in this bottom half, I don't have to do anything, right? The implication is always true here, so I don't have to consider this case. But in this top half, Again, P is always true, and I have to somehow discern between the top line and the bottom line. So formally, the first step that I do is do the splitting, right? And how do I split to force myself to be in this top situation? Well, the answer is kind of simple. I simply assume that P is true, right? If I assume P is true, I'm now boxing myself in to one of these two top possibilities. And again, I can do this purely because if the hypothesis is false, the implication is vacuously true. So now, if I look at these two lines, what's the fundamental difference between the two lines? Well, there's two things. This is a T, that's an F, and this is a T, and that's an F. I don't really have control over here, that's the thing I wanna show, so I then have to actually show that this thing has to be the case, that Q is true. So step two, after I make this assumption that P is true, I have to then show that Q follows from this assumption. So kind of from a broader mathematical perspective, what I'm really doing is I'm assuming that P is true and then taking that as an axiom and using that axiom to conclude that Q then has to be true. So let's just give a real quick example for why this would be true, just hand waving. If N is prime, right? So if I'm assuming N is prime, then I know N plus N well, this thing's going to be equal to 2n, and 2n has the property that is divisible by 2. So whether or not n is prime, and but in particular when n is a prime, 2n is not going to be a prime, right? So since 2n is not a prime, the conclusion then is true, so I can conclude that the implication holds. With those preliminaries out of the way, we can talk about proof by contradiction. Now, proof by contradiction in kind of its most general form is a very flexible technique, but to introduce it, we're going to start with a very inflexible version of proof by contradiction just to justify the technique via kind of the fundamental logic underlying mathematics. So in proof by contradiction, I want to prove some statement A. Now, I'm using A just to distinguish from basic propositions, but A is just some proposition. Right? So now if I want to prove A, uh, there's lots of different possible techniques that you can use, but one very general mathematical technique is I replace A with something that is logically equivalent to A. So instead of proving A, I want to prove some other statement. Okay, so how do we build up this method of proof by contradiction? Well, here's the logical equivalences we need to notice that hold. So A is logically equivalent to A or A. Okay, it's pretty trivial to verify that this is the case, right? So now that I have this, I can further make logical or logical manipulations by taking this first A here and modifying it by using the double negation rule. In particular, I can write it as not, parentheses, not A. Now if I look at this, does this look like anything you've seen before? Pause the video, think about that for a bit. Have I seen something similar to this? Okay, so the answer to that question is yes, you have seen something similar to this. We noticed before not P or Q, 
This was logically equivalent to P implies Q. Now, if I look at the form here, this not A, well, that could take the case of a P, right? I have, still have a negation in front of it. And this A could take the place of Q. So this is going to be logically equivalent to not A, right? The whole thing for P gets plugged in here, implies A. Ah, we know techniques for proving implications, right? We know how to prove an implication. So instead of trying to prove A directly, we now get to use an extra assumption for free. We get to assume that not A is true, and using that assumption, we then try to show A is true. So the big idea here is if I wanted to do a direct proof, if I wanted to just prove A, I have nothing to start with, right? But if I want to use proof by contradiction, I get an extra assumption. In some but not all cases, this extra assumption can make proving things a little bit easier. So it's just a tool that we can use to help us prove something if we find trying to prove it directly is too difficult. Okay, so putting this together and using kind of the stuff that we did with implications over here, we can say that in proof by contradiction, we do two things. In step one, the first thing we do is we assume A is true or rather not true. And after we assume that A is not true, we then have to prove a statement. And the statement we have to prove is that A is true. Okay, so once we prove that A is true, one plus two together via the discussion that we had over here about proving implications, that actually proves that this whole thing here is true. And now since this is logically equivalent to A, by proving step one and step two, we can actually conclude that A itself is true. Okay, so that's proof by contradiction in a nutshell, but uh, where's a contradiction? Like, is anything in here contradictory? Well, here's where the problem comes in. The first thing we did is we assumed that not A is true. Okay, so not A is true, and then we concluded from that statement that A had to be true. So what we really did with putting these two parts together, like this one and two, is we actually concluded that not A and A, right? Not A by assumption and A by proof, that this thing is true. Can this actually be the case? Is it possible to prove not A and A is true? Well, let's just kind of think about it. If A is true, then not A is false, so not A and A is false, okay? And if A is false, well, not A and, it, and A is also false. This thing is a problem. This thing's what we call a contradiction, usually denoted by a line with an X through it like this, or two arrows looking into each other. Uh, it's kind of the more traditional way of thinking about it. But that's why we call this a proof by contradiction. Okay, so in proof by contradiction, TLDR, we assume A is not true, we prove that A is true, and then we say, ah, that's a contradiction, right? So we add this if you want 2.1, where we say, ah, contradiction, this can't be the case. Therefore, the assumption that I made was wrong. Okay, now this is the pure kind of mathematical, logical framework for a proof by contradiction, but there's a version of proof by contradiction that's much more useful that goes a little bit deeper than this. Now, to formally show that the kind of more broad version of proof by contradiction actually works, we need a fair bit more logic than what we currently have. But for the purposes of this course, the idea is that the fundamental problem with proving one and two together is that I proved a contradiction, right? So what I can do is I can improve this or modify this step two and instead prove some contradiction. It doesn't have to contradict my assumption per se, it just have to, has to contradict some statement that I know is true. So just to give a concrete example of what I mean by this more general version of proof by contradiction, let's give a proof by contradiction that the number one is odd. So if I wanna prove by contradiction that one is odd, the first thing I need to do is I need to assume that what I wanna prove is not true. So I first assume that one is not odd, it is even. Okay, now I need to get a contradiction of something. Now here there's lots of things you can contradict and 
Like the hard part of proof by contradiction is coming up with what is easy to contradict. But what we're going to do is we're going to contradict the fact that two is even. We know two is even, right? Assuming we're allowed to know two is even for the purpose of this problem. So what we can do is say, hey, two, well, that's one plus one. Okay, now since I know n is even, by definition, this tells me that there exists a natural number n and z such that one is equal to two n. Okay, so I can replace one of these ones with two n. Okay, so here, this line by definition tells me that two is odd, All right? This is a contradiction. Could I know two's in fact not odd? Two is even. Therefore, since this was a contradiction, my assumption over here was incorrect, so I can conclude that one is odd. Oops. Okay, so that's a basic idea of how this works. So in class, we're going to apply this to things like implications and kind of more broader statements. And we'll show kind of some of the finesses of how proof by contradiction interacts with things with quantifiers. Because there's a couple of different ways that you can do proof by contradictions for quantified statements, and we'll discuss that in class.